right. Well, good morning, officially. We've been chatting amongst ourselves for a while as we waited for the live stream to start, but good morning to all our friends and family out there across the uh, American Plains. We're glad to have you with us. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes and open this morning's investigation into the biblical text by acknowledging the presence of our King. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your love, for your grace to us in all of our circumstances, in all of our situations. We pray for our friends and loved ones who can't be with us this morning because they're traveling or because uh, other needs require them to be elsewhere. If anyone is feeling sick or under the weather, Lord, we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would bring health and healing into their lives. Make their needs known to us so that we can pray for them and see them recover. Father, as we delve into your word in this morning's sessions, I pray in Jesus' name that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open the eyes of our understanding, you would open the ears of our heart to hear you, and you would give me the ability to communicate your truths in a succinct and, and a conscientious way that convicts the heart and draws people closer to you. In Jesus' name, the people of God said. Well, it has been a while... Uh, but we are, um, we are at the place uh, of um, jumping back in to our series on Revelation. Now, in a sense, we never left it. We just had a lot of homework that we needed to do to cover other topics uh, while uh, to kind of lay a groundwork and a foundation so that you would see where we needed to go and when I started to talk about these things in the context of the actual verses of Revelation, I could touch on them, but I couldn't expound on them fully. And you'll see a little bit that, of that even this morning. But I thought that it would be helpful, if we can put the slides up uh, in-house here, I thought that it would be helpful if we at least reviewed the, um, the homework that we assigned from the last time uh, that, that we had you uh, when we ended Revelation chapter 3 in our investigation into the seven churches uh, of Asia Minor. So we had assigned to you, and I posted this last night around 7 o'clock. If you were on, you could have seen it and, and maybe caught up a little bit. But you needed to read Revelation chapter 4. You were going to investigate the throne room of heaven, and you were going to answer for yourselves the questions, who are the 24 elders? We're going to take some guesses in this morning's session, but until we get to chapter 5, we won't really answer it definitively. Uh, and then ask yourself the question, why are they particularly significant to us? Uh, read chapter 5, which is talking about this mysterious and uh, often misconstrued seven-sealed scroll. And then as a counterpoint to that in the Old Testament, read the book of Ruth, because that is going to be very germane to where we're going. But as a way of reintroducing us, because we've been all over prophetic text. And so, Revelation 1-3, Revelation 1-3 gives us a um, unique blessing for understanding this book, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's, it's really an essential um, book for us as disciples to understand. Revelation 1-3 says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. So in effect, this book is saying to you, read me, I'm special. And it's really the only book of the Bible that uh, tells us that it is, in fact, a special book. Now, for those of you that have been around the ministry for a while, uh, we uh, joined a couple of debate groups online. I invited you guys to join them. Uh, via Facebook or whatever, not necessarily because you felt comfortable participating in the debate, but so that you could see that I would respond to or how I would respond uh, to others that raise questions uh, regarding the faith. And we did that uh, in the field of Calvinism versus Armenianism, or we did that with the field of uh, uh, soteriology. This week, I'll be posting a group called Rapture and Revelation that you can also feel free to join. I did it this week because I came across an, an interesting objection from people who hold a different view of the prophetic portions of the book than, than we espouse in this church. And I wanted to see if anybody who shared our views uh, had 
um, come across it, had read anybody who had, who had rebutted it, and of course, the group that I joined, all I got was um, good evidence as to why you need a, a firm basis in sound prophetic teaching about the Bible, because immediately all I got in my news feeds was all of the stuff that proves why people think Christians are wackadoo for uh, believing in end time prophecy at all. And it will be, I don't encourage you to join the group for any reason other than for you to see what's out there. Because to a certain extent, when you're involved in a particular ministry that has a focus on this stuff, you become cloistered into the view that that ministry has. And it can be very helpful to, to see the, the views and the opinions that are out there from other people, one, just to experience them. If they've got merit, fine, look at them. If not, how do we take a look at it and, and how would we respond? So I'll post that in our discipleship group. You can choose for yourself. It's something you want to dig deeper into. Um, but the thing that we are constantly dealing with is your hermeneutical approach or your theory of interpretation and where you swing on this chart whether you take a literal view of the Bible or you take an allegorical or symbolic view of the Bible, will determine where you fall into some of these camps. And specifically in this group, the much smaller, more narrowly focused battle of are we for a pre-tribulation rapture, a mid-tribulation rapture, or a post-tribulation rapture. I can't tell you how many times this week alone I got told that the view of a pre-tribulation rapture is a lie from Satan straight from the pit of hell and uh, I need to correct my thinking lest I go there. So, um, you know, it's, it's an intense debate. And if you're never exposed to it, again, your job is to be equipped to always be ready to have an answer. Sometimes if you don't know the objections, I'm not expecting you to have the answers, but I'm at least trying to expose you uh, to, to some of what is out there. And, and also, I learned this week that uh, Donald Trump is the Antichrist and Obama also is, which I don't understand. Um. Revelation 1.19 shows us the outline for the book of Revelation. It says, write the things, Jesus speaking to the Apostle John, of course, in Revelation chapter 1, he says, write the things which you have seen, and that, of course, was the vision of Christ that John experienced in Revelation chapter 1. He says, and the things which are, and that comprises chapter 2 and 3, the seven letters, the seven churches, of which we've done a complete investigation of and is available to you online. And now we are entering the third part of that outline that Jesus gave, and the things which shall be hereafter, that which follows. In other words, chapters 4 through 22. Now, don't worry, we're not going to all lump it into as if that's one. There, there is an outline to how those, that larger group of chapters works, and we'll break it down as we go. But from Jesus' standpoint, we're really in that, that section, hereafter. And in the Greek, hereafter, is an interesting phrase. It's meta tauta. But after these things, the things that will be hereafter, and the reason that we point that out is we have that phrase hereafter, meta tauta in the Greek being used in Revelation 1.19. And one of the reasons why we, we divide the book this way is the very first words in Revelation 4, chapter 1, is after these things and after this, which is the same words in Greek, metatauta. So it is very natural to say the beginning of that third section starts with the first words of the first verse of the chapter that kind of breaks us into that, that piece of the pie. Revelation 4 1 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things that much must take place after this. After what? After the church age. We've just been describing in incredibly fascinating detail the church age in chapters 2 and 3. Um. So that is kind of how we break down the book. And so this section that we're heading into is really what happens after these things. It's a glimpse, if you will, into the holy of holies of the universe. But before we can jump into the actual text of Revelation 4, there's a couple of things that in this Revelation series we need to, to kind of give you a synopsis of. We've taken the time out to do a complete 
explanation of it in, a, in their own mini-series, but because this, this Revelation series needs to stand on its own, we need to introduce these topics at a glance very quickly. And one of those things is what we call the harpazo, or the catching away, the rapture. And as you will see in a minute, that is important because Revelation chapter 4 just assumes that it happens. And that's going to be a point of major contradiction when, and, and consternation among people who hold different views. But we're going to build the case that the book of Revelation just assumes that the rapture happens. It doesn't necessarily teach it verse by verse. It just takes place. And the reason we know that is by the symbology that we see in Revelation chapter 4 itself. We're going to build that out as we go, but you need to know what that is, okay? You need to, you, for newcomers, you need to understand what that is. And so we're going to be talking about something that is called the doctrine of eminency, and, and there's a lot of words that kind of sound this way, so I always like to spell it out for people. It's not the word eminent Im, uh, in the sense that God is transcendent or far above us. It's not the word eminent as in someone prestigious having a title of outstanding distinction. It is literally the next expectation, the next thing on the program, the very next thing that we expect. And all the way to the earliest days, the church taught what, what we refer to as the doctrine of eminency. It means to, to expect Christ at any moment. Eminency expresses hope. It means that, that Christ can be taking us to be with him at any moment. So it, 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 it uh, admonishes us to be, when he comes, to be found living a pure life. Because you never know when he is going to come for us. And believers are taught to expect him any time. And Paul includes himself among those who looked for Christ's return in verses like 1 Thessalonians 4, 15, 17, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, etc. Timothy was admonished to keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 1 Timothy 6, 14. And Jewish converts were reminded, yet a little while and he shall come, he will come and he will not tarry. That's Hebrews 10, 37. So from a summary point of the rapture doctrine, um, <clears throat> what we need to look at and understand is Revelation 4 says a door was opened. In fact, Revelation says this four times in total. It mentions a voice or a trumpet, which Thessalonians, both of the letters Paul wrote to the city of Thessalonica, was a, a explanation of what we call the blessed hope or, or the rapture, the, the return for Christ for his bride, because they had started, they kind of had two situations going on. Some of them started to lose hope because it hadn't happened yet. Others were so expecting it to happen that they had to be admonished, go return to your jobs, live, stop stomping up and down on your yard and calling it rapture practice. God wants you to be salt and light in this world. And, and so um, Paul had to speak to that. Then, of course, we see that phrase come. And that's speaking that John is experiencing something in a real material heaven. Luke 24, 39 speaks about that. And that, that like a veil was pulled back for, for John to be able to see into the heavenly realm. And of course, we see the rapture talked about in a few places. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17 and 1 Corinthians 15 through 50. We'll look at a few of these, these verses in a moment. But first, what I want to show you is what I would call the promise that Christ talks about. John 14, 1 uh, through 3. It's the Last Supper scene. And Jesus is setting the stage for the disciples. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, also believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. So that's the promise. We're also going to look at the purpose of the rapture, and we're going to look at the process through, through how it happens. And we're going to do it very quickly, because we've got a lot of ground to cover. Now, 
We have said throughout our Revelation series that Revelation often has what we would call a heptatic structure. It has a series of sevens in that. In fact, we're going to experience the next in those series of sevens when we get to chapter 6 and we begin to see the breaking of these seven seals that are on this seven-sealed scroll, and that's going to lead into seven trumpets, etc. Seven, because of the creation week in the Bible, and that's how long it took God to create the heavens and the earth, that is a biblical picture for completion. That's why the Bible uses the number seven to show you a complete picture of something. And many people don't realize this, but there's actually seven rapture or seven type catching aways, because that's all the Greek word harpazo actually means is a catching away that shows us things happening in the Bible. Some kind of foreshadow the rapture that we're describing Others demonstrate that it is a physical catching away of a human body. Enoch in Genesis 5 and Hebrews 11 is discussed. He was a righteous man before God in the days before Noah's flood. And when before the flood came, God just took him. In fact, if you look at the story of the flood, there's three groups. There's the people who God raptured out before judgment came. There's the people who God protected through the judgment. And there's the people who received judgment. And that in and of itself is a picture when people say, well, there's no, the Bible doesn't teach a rapture doctrine. Well, it foreshadowed it in the flood. He raptured out one dude. And then, of course, we can get to Elijah. Elijah was definitely raptured away. Elijah in 2 Kings 2, 1, verse 11, he didn't go to his grave. God came and he took him up to heaven. And again, the picture is that is God didn't descend and land on the earth. God took Elijah to him. It's a picture of a catching away. Jesus, again, is a picture of a physical being being captured away into the clouds at his ascension. Philip is a little bit of a different story, but he gets spiritually translated from one location to another when it came to the issue of ministering to the Ethiopian eunuch. And when he was done with that and he had completed his task, what happened? God caught him away and the eunuch saw him no more. Paul describes in 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, that he was caught away to the third heaven, much like John is describing here in Revelation chapter 4, 5, and following for us. And then, of course, as we said, the body of Christ is going to experience a rapture, a capturing away, and John is experiencing one now. So seven total raptures. In our rapture series, we did an entire session on this topic, the Jewish wedding model. The Jewish wedding model is something that all through the Gospels, Jesus relies on in order to establish a pattern for many of his parables. And the wedding model is broken down into several steps. The first is called the ketubah. It's, it is the, the, the process through which betrothal is made. And in the ketubah, we could translate that into English by calling it the wedding contract. It is the terms and the conditions, oftentimes written upon a scroll, by which the groom would be able to receive that scroll, open that scroll, and declare his bride pure, and take for himself his bride, and also any of the assets that she had from her family line that needed to be redeemed. We see that picture through Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, in the book of Ruth. <clears throat> we see it described in a bunch of the scriptures that we have on the screen, and then payment of the purchase price is set apart for the bride. The groom would pay a price to get his bride as surety that he would come back for her because the big component of this is the bridegroom departs to the father's house, prepares a room. That's what Jesus was talking about in John 14. See, he's using, if, if you don't understand the meta, his Jewish disciples would have got this, but we, we grew up with a different, a totally different wedding um, tradition than the Jews had so they didn't link it to a Jewish wedding when Jesus was speaking he's literally saying I'm going to go but I'm going to come back for you and the bride prepares for his imminent or next expectation expectation return because interestingly enough in a Galilean Jewish wedding not even the bridegroom knew when he was going to be able to return for his bride only the father of the bride knew Similarity when the disciples ask in the book of Acts, when will you return for us? He says, it's not for you to know. Not even the son knows. Only the father in heaven knows the day or the hour that I will return for you because the bridegroom's job was to go back to the father's house, 
build an addition onto the father's house. And yes, that newly married couple would have to, nightmare to most of us, live with mom and dad for the first section of their marriage. Okay? That's what would happen. The bride had to make herself ready. She had to be prepared to go because the groom's procession happened at a surprise gathering. The groom and his half of the bridal party, his best men and their whole procession, they would come at night, they would come with torches, and they would bring the bride to the father's house with no warning. And if you don't see that anywhere in the Bible, I submit to you, go read the Song of Solomon again. That is most of the story of that book. All the secrets to Revelation are contained somewhere else in the Old Testament. <clears throat> then what happened is a seven-day marriage supper. It was a feast that lasted seven days celebrating the consummation of the bride and the groom coming together as husband and wife. Isn't it interesting that the 70th week of Daniel, the last period we know as the time of Jacob's trouble, is seven years long. Why do we opt for a pre-tribulation rapture? Because if the rapture happens after the tribulation, the marriage supper of the Lamb is a fast food lunch. It doesn't have the time to fulfill the prophetic pattern. And we're not the ones injecting the pattern. Jesus did in John chapter 14. You see what I'm saying? And people miss that. So now let's talk very briefly about the marriage being fulfilled. We can see these key components described through the balance of the New Testament after Jesus makes the promise. The covenant is established in 1 Corinthians 11.25. What was the bridal price that Christ paid for us as his bride? He sent the Holy Spirit. That was our bridal price. He said it will never leave us. It will never forsake us. Ergo... Again, the entire end time scenario cannot take place unless the restrainer, used with personal pronouns, when it says unless the restrainer is removed, the lawlessness one can't come, all of those verses that talk about that kind of thing. The restrainer is the Holy Spirit. Well, if the Holy Spirit is our bride price, our engagement ring, so to speak, and Jesus promised that he would never leave us or forsake us, how does Jesus take the Holy Spirit out of the way unless he takes us with us because otherwise he's separating us from our bride price? And that would make Jesus violate the conditions of his marriage. Again, I'm not making it up. The pattern of prophecy is putting it into place. So the purchase price was paid in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Paul talks about that. The bride is set apart. He talks about how we are set apart in places like Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. 1 Corinthians 6.11, Hebrews 10.10, and Hebrews 13.12. Again, all of these slides will wind up in the comment sections under our videos, so you can open them up and look for them. Do this study again for yourself, or check out our uh, uh, three-component series to the rapture and get a full hour discussion of all of this. Uh, the bridegroom must leave for his father's house, we just saw in John 14. And the escort to accompany him upon his return to gather his bride is described in 1 Thessalonians 4, which we will now read beginning with verse 13. It says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Every time Paul says that, we should pay attention. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with a voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. He spells it out for us. So as we said, there were seven raptures in the Bible and as we kind of move forward in this place, all of these that I have in the brackets here on the same slide we looked at either, earlier, they're actually using that same word, that harpazo, that catching away in the Greek that we use to do that. People will come down the pipe and they say, well, the word rapture is not even in the Bible. Yeah, it's not in your Greek Bible because we get it from a Latin word. 
when the Bible was written by, uh, re- translated by Jerome into the Latin Vulgate, the word harpazo became the word rapimir in the Latin, from which we get our word Latin. So that, again, is a really cheap, stupid tactic to tell us our doctrine is not there. No, it's just not in your Greek Bible because it's not a Greek word. We know that. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50. It says, now I, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. This is the purpose of why it's accomplished. We shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. It is very interesting because modern science, uh, starting with a guy by the name of Max Planck, they began to look at the fact that that molecules and and other, uh, other components, they can only be subdivided so many times till you get to the absolute smallest unit, which they call a Planck unit. And one of the things that can only be subdivided so many times before it loses its properties is time. There are only so many times you can subdivide a minute into a second, into a nanosecond, into a microsecond, so forth, until suddenly time no longer possesses the qualities of time. And that happens to be 10 to the minus 43 seconds. That is called Planck's constant. Time can't go any slower. It is possible that what Jesus or uh, what Paul is describing here when he says the twinkling of an eye, that's not a blink. A blink can be measured, but how long does it actually take for light to twinkle in your eye? So my mom used to tell me, oh, back when you were just a twinkle in your father's eye, and I'd say, ew, gross, let's not talk about that, right? The twinkling of an eye is the smallest measure of time that you can possibly, like you could literally be staring at somebody and the next moment they've disappeared, caught away. 1 Corinthians 15 54 and 55, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? And Hades, where is your victory? And some people would say, well, see, there'll be no more death after that. So therefore, that has to be the second coming. People don't understand, not everybody is going to have victory over death. The church is going to have victory over death. So they try to position the rapture after the tribulation because there's going to be death during the tribulation because this moment's going to happen once death is beaten. Yeah, beaten for who? Just because somebody wins. This, this, isn't, this isn't where you get a participation trophy. Just because you're breathing doesn't mean you get a blue medal. We beat death because we are in Christ and in Christ Jesus beat death. There can still be death in the tribulation. There can still be death In the millennial period, there can still be people who are not of that class of people who've won victory over death. How many different crowns were awarded to the seven churches in the previous two chapters of Revelation for not seeing the second death, not being put through the hour of the trial? But see, they try to say, no, death is the last enemy to be destroyed, so therefore Satan has to be destroyed and all this other stuff has to happen before this happens. It's a bad argument. You're just, you're conflating the audience. This is an audience written to the church. And the church beats death at the moment the church doesn't die. If the church is raptured tomorrow, the church beats death. Because we went to be with him and we did. Elijah beat death when he didn't die. Enoch beat death when he didn't die. Why? Because he didn't die. Not complicated. So as we talk for just a moment about the physics of immortality, after our catching away, Scripture tells us we become like our bridegroom, that there is a dimensionality to it. This isn't some pie-in-the-sky fake thing. This is a very real reality. In fact, it is probably a reality that is much realer than our reality. We live in a reality of three dimensions, length, height, width. If If you're Marty McFly and Dr. Emmett Brown, you think about the fourth dimension, that's time. Okay, modern quantum physics, modern quantum mechanics and string theory postulate that the universe is actually comprised of 10 dimensions. 
six of which we can't see. A rabbi by the name of Nachmanides in the 12th century AD postulated from an examination of the Hebrew in Genesis 12 that reality was composed of 10 dimensions, four of which are knowable. Science is a mountaintop, and when scientists get to the top, they see a bunch of theologians sitting there going, where you been? What is the purpose of this? Well, beloved, we are now sons of God. We talked about this as we wrapped up our series on the Antichrist. That is a very specific term. It means a direct creation of God. And we can break that all down for you, but not in this session. <clears throat> it says, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, who is he? Jesus what is ap the apocalypto? What does that mean? Apocalypsis in Greek. That means the unveiling or the revealing of Jesus. That's what revelation means. We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 2 through 3 says, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven, if we indeed, having been clothed, shall not be found naked. And that brings us back to this term. It is the term oketerion, that term habitation. In the Greek, it literally means like a house or putting on a body. It is only found in the verse I just read you and in Jude 6. It means to put on or over one piece of clothing over another presently being worn. It is our new bodies in Christ. And creepily enough, it is the exact same thing that supposedly the angels who fell took off, according to Jude 6, when they stepped in and sinned. They took off this housing, this, this new body. So pressing ahead, and we did this, um, there are a ton of verses, and I'm just going to put them on your screen so that they're here. I have no way to, uh, to go through all of them in this session, but we did in our rapture series, or we looked at a lot of them at least. There's two events, and people miss it because they don't have the resolving power to see it. Too many people think the rapture and the second coming are two different things. But in fact, they are two very different events foretold in Bible prophecy. One group of scriptures on your screen shows the, the rapture doctrine. Another group of scriptures shows the second coming. Again, if you're going to go do a verse-by-verse -verse study on this, read all the way around it. I'm just kind of giving you a homing beacon to find the entire context. Don't just read those verses by themselves. But many, uh, since the medieval church, hold the view that the second coming and the rapture are somehow the, the same. They are not. <clears throat> the rapture is the translation of believers. The translated saints go to heaven. The earth is not judged during the rapture. The rapture is imminent. It can happen at any moment. It is signless. There is nothing we need to look for for it to happen. The rapture is not in the Old Testament. It is only hinted at. It affects believers only. And it happens before the day of wrath. However, in the second coming, there is no translation involved. The saints return to the earth with Christ. How can we return to the earth with Christ if we're not already with him? The earth is judged at the second coming. It follows definite predicted signs that have to happen before the second coming can happen. It is predicted in the Old Testament. It affects all men on the earth. And it concludes with the day of wrath of God. So that's the rapture. In a nutshell, if you want more information, we did three hours on it for you. But with that said, the reason I reviewed all of it is so when we now step into Revelation chapter 4 for the balance of this session, you are going to begin to see some things that indicate to us that the rapture must have taken place at some point between the end of Revelation chapter 3, where we still see the seven churches on the earth, and the beginning, verse 1, of Revelation chapter 4. And the serious biblical student will acknowledge these things and admit what is going on. So let's take an outline of the chapter very quickly. This shows us the throne room of heaven. And as we've just been saying, the harpazo, when does it happen? It must have happened prior to this verse. Verses 2 through 3 are going to describe the throne room of God. And you may not know this, but this is a picture we have seen before in our Bibles. And it is your challenge to figure out where they are. We'll discuss some of it. 
Verse 4 is going to discuss a very specific group of people that is often misinterpreted. Who they are, what they mean, what their significance is. Verse 5 is going to point us to the seven lamps burning. Can anybody tell me in Revelations 1, in Revelation 2, in Revelation 3, what were the seven golden lampstands? Anybody? It was the church. Well, we are now in heaven. Right? We're in the throne room of heaven. John has, the very beginning of the ver, uh, verse says, come up here. John is in heaven. And there are seven lampstands in heaven. If the seven lampstands were the church in chapter 1, and they were the church in chapter 2 and 3, what are the seven lampstands in chapter 4? The church. Where are the seven lampstands in chapter 4? <gasps> heaven! The picture is not hard to see. You have to deny the theory of expositional constancy to not see it. Then we're going to see this interesting thing called the sea of glass. And I'm going to show you a picture that, that I'm, I can almost guarantee you most of you have never seen. What is this thing called the sea of glass? We've all heard of it. It's in heaven. We're walking by the crystal sea. I'm going to show you a picture from the word of God that I think is absolutely amazing that I discovered as I was prepping this session for you. And uh, it is a picture of how good God is. I can't wait to get there. <clears throat> then, verse 6 through 8, we're going to talk about these four living creatures, otherwise known as cherubim. And who are they? What are they? What do they mean? So much time. I don't know that we're going to make it. We'll get as far as we can. Revelation 4.1, again, it says, After these things, metatauta in the Greek, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Verses 2 and 3, it says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. So we're discussing thrones. What is this seat of universal power? The word throne appears 58 times in the New Testament, 43 of which are in the book of Revelation, 14 of which are in chapter 4. We know that the Messiah will sit on several thrones. He will sit on his father's throne, according to Psalms 110, verse 1, and Revelation 3, 21. He will sit on the throne of his mercy, Hebrews 4, 16, which is a direct call out to the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. And remember, what is by the Ark, on the Ark of the Covenant uh, by where the glory of God dwelt? To cherubim, whose wings overcome you're going to begin to see that the bible constantly paints a consistent picture of what the throne room of god looks like and the throne room of god was typified for us in the holy of holies of the tabernacle and the temple of the old testament and god has built that picture for us in the bible over and over and over again and that is one of the things that consistently points at the bible's integrated design because how did that same picture manifest itself over hundreds, if not thousands of years, while the Bible was being written. Okay? And then, of course, he will sit on the throne of David. Isaiah 9, 7 and Luke 1, 32. Gabriel predicts that to Mary in Luke 1, 32. Then the 12 apostles will sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes and angels, according to Matthew 19, 28 and 1 Corinthians 6, 3. Here in another verse, in just a moment, we're going to see these 24 elders sit on thrones. That's 24 thrones. And unbelievers will be judged at a great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, 21. So here's a picture. Precious and semi-precious stones. Emeralds and jaspers and sardius. This is going to be some of that picture here. Emeralds. Why is that there? Well, the word rainbow in the Greek, iris, and it can also mean halo. So we see this picture, this illuminescent light around the throne room of God. It's beautiful. And we see the emerald in Genesis 9, 11 through 17, and Exodus 24, 1. 
And isn't it amazing that the symbol that is for such sinfulness and such corruption and such an abomination to God when it comes to the sin of homosexuality is the symbol that completely surrounds the throne room of God. I don't know why, but I get so excited when I get to teach on chapters like Revelation 4 and Revelation 5 because, you know, you can preach all the sermons you want about living a good life and having a good marriage and, 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 and do that little stuff, but we don't teach enough on what God's glorious throne room is going to look like. We don't teach enough. Yes, it's going to end in judgment for unbelievers, and yes, that's going to be depressing and sad, and, and yes, you know, we, we can think of those, those pictures of, you know, you're fired, this is, this is the end. But for those of us that think to reside in that place, do you realize David said better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere? Better is one day in this room before your great right throne than a thousand elsewhere. That's an amazing thing. And emerald is one of the base colors of the rainbow. And then he who sits upon the throne, later to appear as part of the wall and the foundation of the new Jerusalem in Revelation 12, or in Revelation 21 and uh, elsewhere, we see jasper. And for those of you that don't know what jasper is, jasper is most likely a clear stone. It is very likely that diamond is what John had in view when he was describing this. You notice God never gets described in the traits of his physical character, but he gets described in the traits of his glory. He gets described in the traits of, of his shiningness, and it, and it often has to do with gemstones. The last stone that we see here is the Sardius. We saw that Pliny says it was discovered in the city of Sardis. We looked at that when we looked at that church and that its color was fiery red. It was the first stone in the breastplate of the high priest representing the tribe of Rumid. Uh, the firstborn of Jacob, Jesus is seen as the firstborn of the dead. So to see that stone in this place here is not surprising. It is the sixth stone in the foundation of the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21, 20. So we begin to see, again, we, we look at this imagery because the imagery is going to create a pattern. With that, let's keep going. Revelation 4, 4 says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their head who are these people these 24 elders well there's some old testament priestly precedents david created 24 courses for priests in first chronicles 24 1 through 19 that each served for two weeks in the course of the year, and they were relieved on, on the Sabbath, ending their period. So he established that as a way for all the priests to serve. Uh, then there's non-Levitical priest, priestly orders throughout the Bible. Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, was a priest of Midian in Exodus 3. Jacob tithes way before the tithe was ever established in Genesis 28, 22. And Abraham tithed to a man named Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest in Genesis 14. And then, of course, the Messiah himself is said to be our priest and our high priest, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So we begin to have to look that 24 is a symbol, somehow, some way of of priestly ramifications. But, but what does that mean? Who are these individuals? Well, they obviously represent a complete group because the only other time we see 24 in the Bible is David's 24 courses, so it speaks to completeness. But there's a couple of things that these people cannot be. They can't be tribulation believers because we see believers who are going to become martyrs unto death in Revelation 7, 13 through 14. So they're not tribulation saints. They can't be angels because we specifically see angels called out in Revelation 7, 11. And it's interesting, you're going to see this. As John begins to ask questions through Revelation 6 through 22, two groups of people are always going to answer him. If he asks something about what's happening on the earth, angels answer him. If he asks something about what's happening in heaven, one of the 24 elders answers him. Every time. <clears throat> And it also can't be the nation of Israel because we're going to see the nation of Israel still on the earth in Revelation 7 and Revelation 12, etc. So, so we know who it can't be. So what are some of their distinguishing characteristics? Well, they have thrones, and we saw that thrones were going to be awarded to the church in Revelation 3.21. 
They are dressed in white raiment, which is a promise to the overcomer to the church in Revelation 3.25. They have crowns of gold, which crowns are promised to the church to two separate churches, once in Revelation 2.10 and once in Revelation 3.11. The song of the redeemed is what they, they sing in the next chapter in Revelation 5, 9 through 10. So these are redeemed. The angels have not, what, what, what would angels be redeemed of? You had lots of interpreters who have different views on Revelation say they're angels. Redeemed from what? Why are they singing the song of the redeemed? They have no right to sing that song. And they are called elders in Revelation 5, 10. They are also called kings and priests. And have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Wait, these are kings and priests who will reign on the earth. What is the group that will reign on the earth when Jesus comes back? The church. We'll confirm that when we get to Revelation 5 in full. But here again, we see the seven lapstands. We see the 24 elders. We see... Lots of pictures in Revelation 4 that the church is been translated, has been translated to heaven. And they have crowns. And these aren't crowns like a king would wear. Jesus wears a diadem or like a, an authoritative crown. These are crowns in Greek called a Stephanos. They are like a laurel wreath given to the winners of the original Greek Olympics. <clears throat> we see a crown of life in James and Revelation for those who have suffered for his sake. We see a crown of righteousness in 2 Timothy 4.8 for those who loved his appearing. We see a crown of glory in 1 Peter 5.4 for those who fed the flock. We see a crown incorruptible for 1 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 9.5 for those who press on steadfastly. And we see a crown of rejoicing in 1 Thessalonians 2.19 for those who win souls. Even their crowns are indicative of victors in Christ who are now gathered before a complete group gathered before the throne of God. When we get to Revelation 4, 5, it says, and from the throne proceeds lightnings, thunderings, and voices. And it is very interesting because those same terms are the exact things that the Jews heard in Exodus at Mount Sinai when Moses went up the mountain to get the law. They heard thunderings and lightnings and voices and in our study of the five or the seven feasts of Moses we submit that the rapture is not the feast of trumpets the church was born on the feast of weeks the feast of pentecost 50 days after the feast of first fruits that in jewish history even to this day is our celebration of the giving of the law at mount sinai the church came in with fiery tongues mount sinai was birthed in fire and the church will will most likely go out on its birthday. And we base part of that on an interesting literal rabbinical note that says Enoch, who was raptured before the flood, he was raptured on his birthday. He was taken out on the same day he was born. Will the church be taken out on the same day it was born? Why? Because then what that opens us up for the fall feasts, Jesus' second coming on the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Judgment on the Feast of Atonements. And as Ezekiel tells us near the end of the book, there will be the, the, the observance of the Feast of Tabernacles in the Millennial Age. Fits the pattern. Taking it as fast as we can here, lampstands on the earth versus lampstands in heaven. Uh, we see in Revelation 2 and 3, the lampstands are the seven churches. We're told that directly by Jesus himself in Revelation 1.20. The seven spirits that are before the throne mentioned just prior uh, where it says seven lampstands which are burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God. Again, the lampstands are connected to the fire that is on the lampstands. What was the bride price? The bride's price was the Holy Spirit himself. How can he remove the fire without taking the lamp with it is essentially the imagery that is being evoked there. Okay? the Holy Spirit, and the church. So the lampstands, to be consistent, must be the churches in Revelation 4 and 5, and the seven spirits are seen here in the throne room of God. And what does that seven spirits thing mean? Go back to Isaiah 11, 1 through 2. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Remember this verse for chapter 5. You're going to need it. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, or the root of Jesse, 
The spirit of the Lord, one, shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, two, and understanding, three, and the spirit of counsel, four, and might, five, and the spirit of knowledge, six, and of the fear of the Lord, seven. It is a sense of the completeness of the spirit of God. The complete spirit of God resting on the seven-branched candlestick that is the church taken to be in heaven where the church is also typified by these 24 elders who are described in no uncertain terms that can only be the church. Other expositors can't see a rapture because they can't see the church in the throne room in Revelation chapter 4. You have to deny a lot of biblical symbolism to have a different interpretation. Does that make sense? Okay. Revelation 6 before the throne was a sea of glass like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. I'm going to attempt to do everything that I'm about to do very quickly so we can have this all in one session. Please bear with me. So what is this crystal sea? Everybody just thinks of it. I mean, I remember the, the uh, Ray Bolt song, Thank You, I finally got to heaven. I walked along the crystal sea from when I was a kid. But an interesting picture emerges if, in fact, the church is in view in the throne room of God, if the 24 elders are the church, if the lampstands are the church, if the seven spirits of God are the spirit of God burning upon the church, if that picture is true, then the fact that God chooses this time to show a crystallized sea is very interesting. Because in the Bible, Matthew chapter 14 Mark chapter 6, John chapter 6, we see Jesus walking calmly on the water during a stormy and tumultuous sea. And then randomly, as if for no reason, Peter jumps up and says, if it's really you, God, call me and I'll come to you. He had this expectation that if Jesus said, you can come to me, that Peter could defy physics and walk on water. And then the truly mind-blowing thing about the picture is he did. But what happened? He took his eyes off of Jesus and started to get his eyes on the, th on, on the world and on the storm. And what happened? He began to sink. Let me ask you this question. Do you think it is possible to take your eyes off of God when you're in the throne room of God? Ergo, the sea hardens and becomes crystallized. And every believer that is in that room can walk upon the water without any fear. Of sinking beneath the waves. Is that not an amazing picture of the completeness of the redemption of Jesus Christ? And if we don't see the 24 elders as the church, if we don't see the lampstands as the church, all of that symbolism disappears. You with me? So that brings us to Revelation 7, or Revelation 4 7. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Now, we see Ezekiel experienced a very similar vision to what John is describing in Ezekiel 1, 5 through 8. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, <coughs> and this was their appearance. They had a likeness of a man. Each one had four faces. And each one had four wings. Now, interestingly enough, in Revelation, each one has one face. Each has a different face. In Ezekiel, each has all four faces. In Revelation, they have six wings. In Ezekiel, they only have four wings. It says, their legs were straight and their soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. The hands of the man were under their wings on their four sides and each had four faces and wings. Their wings touched one another, verse 9, and creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. And then, of course, we get to verse 10, and it says, and for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each had the face of a lion on the right side, and each had the face of an ox on the left side, and each had the face of an eagle. Skip ahead to Ezekiel 10, Verse 14, it says, each one had four faces. This is now Ezekiel. 
When Ezekiel saw the vision he saw on chapter 1, this throne was on the earth and he saw it moving over the earth. In Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel is now having his own vision of the throne room of God, which we'll discuss more when we discuss chapter 5. But just for now, verse 14 says, Each one had four faces. The first was the face of a cherub. The second was the face of a man. The third was the face of a lion. And the, face, uh, and the fourth was the face of an eagle. The ox, for some reason, has been swapped out. But these are the four creatures that we see before the throne of God. It is a picture of these living creatures around the Holy of Holies because the throne room of God is the Holy of Holies of the universe. This is a totally different word in the Greek from the word in Revelation 13 for beast. Some translations are for beasts. Beast in Revelation 13 is a Greek word for a terrible creature, a frightening creature. This simply is zoa, which is the same word we get our term zoology from. They're just living things because John can't find anything else to describe them as. But we know them to be cherubs. So I just want to remind you as we close, the session will be just a little bit long, but we're almost done. The picture of the living creatures around the Holy of Holies. We do this in our Matthew commentary. There is a design to the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew presents Jesus as the Messiah. Mark presents Jesus as the servant. Luke presents uh, Jesus as the son of man because he traces his genealogy uh, all the way back uh, to, to Mary. And uh, John presents him as the son of God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. You're going to see that these same creatures, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle, present themselves in the Gospels themselves. Now, these are the tribal standards of four tribes, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Ephraim, the tribe of Reuben, and the tribe of Dan. Now, some people are going to say, wait a minute, the tribe of Dan was given the, the, the emblem of a serpent in the Bible. Yeah, that's because they did some bad things and God kind of changed their story. But originally, their symbol was an eagle. So the faces, we could even begin to relate the gospel. Matthew seeing him as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark seeing him as the servant, ergo the ox. Luke seeing him as the man, because he saw him as the son of man. And John seeing him as the son of God, could represent the eagle. In fact, we could take the time to go through all of these things, and we do in our commentary on the book of Matthew, that show that the Bible has designed the Gospels each to have a unique standpoint, uh, every one of them not repeating, but having a unique perspective. But for now, that's as far as I'm going to take this. What I want to remind you of is the camp of Numbers in uh, or the camp of Israel as delineated by God in Numbers chapter 2. Every detail is in the Bible by deliberate design and consistency shows divine op uh, authorship. So, in the middle you see the tabernacle, which I had just laid out before you a few minutes ago, a map. You had the outer courts, you had the inner place, the holy place, and you had the holy of holies. Surrounding that, the Levites were told to camp. And they were told they could only camp at the cardinal directions. So strict obedience denies northeast, southeast, northwest, southwest. They could only camp northwest, south, and east of the tabernacle. That's where they had to camp. The rest of the tribes, the other technically 13, if you, or the other 12, because if you don't know this, you've got 13 tribes because uh, Jacob adopted Joseph's two sons. So you have Manasseh and Ephraim. So sometimes the Bible lists 12 with Joseph being one tribe. Sometimes the Levites are left out. and You still have 12 tribes because Joseph's divided in two. Just a little detail. But the other tribes, four tribes apiece, they had to line up around the Levites and they were only allowed to camp as wide as the Levites went. That gives us an interesting thing because the camp of Judah had to, had to camp east of the Levites. The camp of Reuben had to camp south of the Levites, etc., etc. Now, <clears throat> for the purposes of what I've done, let's imagine I've zoomed out and I've put what you just had on the screen a little bit smaller. We have Judah east on bottom of our map here, okay, east on bottom. Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun formed the camp of Judah, those three tribes, and they had to camp to the east. 
Reuben, Simeon, and Gab had to camp to the south. Dan, Nephtali, and Asher had to camp to the uh, north. And Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin had to camp to the west. Okay? So now you have all the camps around the Holy of Holies, around the priests, the priestly 24 courses of priests that, that David set up. Okay, they're all there. Now, they weren't in 24 courses yet because David did that later, but you get the point. Here they are. But then Numbers chapter 2 goes on to give us the numbers of each camp and each tribe. And they're all gathered around the standards of their lead camp. So the standard of Judah, the standard of Dan, the standard of Ephraim, the standard of Reuben, the lion, the uh, uh, man, the ox, and the eagle surrounding the Holy of Holies. The tribe of Ephraim, or the camp of Ephraim had 108,000 people. So that's how far it went. They could go as long as their population uh, would allow them to go. The camp of Reuben had 151,000 people. The camp of Dan had 157,000 people. So essentially, they were about as long as each other. And so they were able to go to the south and the north that long. The camp of Judah was the longest camp with 186,000 people, so it would have been the longest camp. So if you were Balaam standing on a mountain looking down at the camp of Israel, you would have seen the picture of a cross. You tell me how a picture of the Christian Messiah's cross got in the Jewish Torah 1,500 years before Jesus ever showed up on the scene. But again, if you look at it, it is the tribe or the same picture of the Holy of Holies, the same living creatures surrounding the throne in that place. Let's wrap up this chapter. It says, the four living creatures have each having six wings were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night. They say, holy, 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 Lord Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And that should call to mind Isaiah 6, 3. It's a reference to the Trinity. Holy is the Father, holy is the Son, holy is the Holy Spirit. Revelation 4, 9 through 10 says, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So Revelation chapter 4 is a gargantuan picture of worship breaking out by the redeemed of the church in the presence of God, worshiping by the crystal sea, a picture of their overcoming the holy of holies of the universe. But there is a problem. Something about, is about to rob John of the joy that he would have Revelation 5, verse 1 through 2 says, And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and loose its seals? <coughs> and no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll. Or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. Your assignment for the next time we're live is to read chapter 5 and try to uncover what is this seven sealed scroll that is robbing the most worshipful moment in the history of humanity from its joy. What could possibly be that tragic? Read the book of Ruth. The Jewish marriage contract is called a ketubah. Your assignment is to guess where in the Bible is the most detailed marriage contract written down. The answer is going to surprise you. And it is huge. Huge. Read Daniel 7, verses 9 through 10, and read Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, 
Where else have we visited this throne room of heaven in our Bibles? Familiarize yourself with that picture. That is Revelation chapter 4. Let's take a break.